All right, thank you very much. Yeah, so what I'll do is um, I've decided um, uh, the Alchemy A that, uh, that Philip is talking about, so that's a, a small investment arm that we've started, but I've decided to um, rather talk about uh, EMS as our company and specifically our story, how, how it happened. Um, we've been quite successful and we started as a startup here in, in uh, Stellenbosch and just take you through what we've, what we've done. Uh, and then afterwards, I'll just at the end, I'll just say a few things about entrepreneurship that I think is quite important that I've learned through the, through the years. Okay, so this is uh, EMS is our company, and I can you hear at the back there? Okay, so EMS is our company, and uh, I say they're the penthouse boys because we started here on the fifth floor of uh, um, of electronic engineering. So in the in the 1990s, um, me and a few other people were working in ele electromagnetics. Um, we got quite a lot of funding at that stage from the, from the government, South African government, uh, electronic warfare, radar and things like that. So we had a very good lab, very good setup. Um, and uh, so we were solving Maxwell's equations at, at that stage for specifically military applications. Um, the people that I show you is the people that the professors and the people that studied with me in the, in the penthouse and everybody in red there is still part of EMSs and was quite a core part of, of this company of ours. Um, so what happened is um, I did my PhD in electromagnetics and uh, um, when we finished the, it was the change of government so the military budgets were cut uh, and we realized that there is still quite a lot of contracts out there uh, in electromagnetics that's sort of running out so the military uh, budgets were going down but at that same stage commercial application for electromagnetics and antennas became viable so Vodacom started, MTN started and also South Africa opened up and we st could start emailing internationally and get contacts there so what we did is I think one important thing is we didn't have an idea with a product um, that we tried to um, make uh, into a business. What we did is we decided to start a company uh, in this general field of antennas and electromagnetics and see um, what comes out of that. So it's slightly different, I think, than most tech startups who's got an idea that wants to develop it. And I think there's quite a, a good advantage to, uh, to that because it allows you to pivot quite widely um, because you're looking for various opportunities. Um, we also started in a, in a something like a launch lab at that stage at Technopark. Uh, the IDC sponsored um, a space like this. It wasn't, it wasn't as Googleish as this, but it was the space that you can get cheap um, rent and infrastructure that, that you shared. Um, so it was very useful for us to, uh, at a very low cost, get, get the support in, in terms of starting a company. So I think that's a, a very good idea and, and you should use, utilize it. So I won't go through everything here, but this is just our timeline of the different things that we actually made money from. So we started off with our company, did some projects, uh, did some research projects for Vodacom, uh, then created a product a few years later, which we saw out of the market was a need for. Uh, we started becoming involved in the SKA project. Uh, and out of all these activities, we um, identify typically gaps in the markets because we're active in those markets. And then from those gaps, we would develop products or services that we can, can service. So um, this is our company. This is the end of uh, 2013, middle, just before the middle of this year. So we, we've got offices in Technopark, three offices in Technopark, distribution um, channels all over the world, um, not for only our FECO product, but also for other products. And we were about 80 engineers um, and you can see very focused on electromagnetics, um, 13 PhDs, 28 master's degrees um, so after about 20 years. So um, this is our income uh, chart. So I think uh, what, we, what we managed to do at the beginning here is to do services, uh, create revenue from that and then invest in products. I think if you look at this you can see in the first it is a long road. It's not a. It's not an IT industry where there's within three or four years you either go bust or get bought out. It's more of an engineering type of company. So for the first uh, few years, we actually put most of our income and and uh, profits back into products that we 
generated. And, and in the last 10 years or so, we really started making um, very good profits as well on, on top of the revenue that we created. Um, and our income was always, uh, we started off just in South Africa. And then at some stage, it was quite a lot income internationally. And now it's about 50-50 from international income and, and local income. Um, so this is, uh, I think, what we did, just to show it over here, is that typically with a tech startup, you need funding, you need investment, you need to start, and you go through the dip where you um, where actually spend money before you start creating money. And uh, yeah, so we didn't know any of these terms at that stage at all. Uh, we, what we did is we, it just made sense for us to try to get service contracts, uh, and those service contracts then funded... Um, products that we developed. So this graph here, we had a big contract with Vodacom and we uh, generated funds from that contract and reinvested that into our FECO product until FECO really started making very good money. Um, so in terms of uh, the specific uh, projects and uh, products, so the, our, our biggest product was FECO. So this was an electromagnetic simulation package for en engineers for uh, designing, assisting engineers for designing antennas or uh, just analyzing the electromagnetic environment. So there's an example over there. So you've got a vehicle and you've got some antennas inside the vehicle or outside the vehicle and you want to know before you actually build it um, you know, what's the best design. Uh, now this sounds obvious now but in, in 1997 it wasn't so obvious. Um, it was just at the stage when computers became fast enough to de do realistic electromagnetic simulations. Um, most of the clients that we tried to get in 1997, 1998 said, but uh, we, we, we use textbooks. We design these things from textbooks and we just can't see that we're going to use computers to do it. Um, but at that stage already mechanical engineering did quite a lot of work in terms of simulations. So yeah, I think we were quite lucky in terms of our timing. Uh, we were working in terms of numerical electromagnetics at the university exactly at the same time when computers became fast enough that, that this could be a commercial um, application. So what we, what we did, uh, there's two other companies, Ansoft and CST, which was our biggest competitors, Germany and, and the United States. Um, so we sold um, internationally. And first from South Africa, we went to all the trade shows and, and tried to sell FECA from there. Um, it was quite difficult to sell such a high-tech package from South Africa, so very soon after we started, we established international distribution channels. And the way that we did that is we went to um, America uh, and uh, identified people that we knew from the academic world that's active in this field and tried to look for somebody that wants to resell this, that's knowledgeable in this field, uh, and they became re resellers for us. And we all did that all over the world, and we also got a, a partner in from Germany, which established the European um, channel. And then really after that, we had to give 40% of our sales, uh, a percentage uh, of our sales away, but the sales just grew drastically when we established those international channels. So as you can see here, uh, we sold to quite a lot of big companies. And these uh, are the two critical people, our German colleague, uh, Ulrich Jakobus, uh, uh, which we signed up. And um, he, he was the original designer of FECO. Uh, and that company was sold to an American company uh, last year. And uh, Ulrich and Grunem, a colleague that started it with me, the company, is now working for Altair. So that company was completely bought out. And it was exactly at the right time. We, we, we went for a very niche market, and we got that market and really penetrated and became the market leader in, in that niche market internationally. Um, so the second thing we were involved with was uh, we did, with our electromagnetic simulations, we did um, quite a lot of work. Uh, it was research work for exposure to cell phones and base stations. Um, and we were f f uh, some of the first people um, publishing in this area we actually get uh, very good information on what the fields are inside the human body. And uh, there we were also extremely lucky because in, while we were doing that, uh, Vodacom got a very big lawsuit against them. So they, uh, uh, for cell phone exposure. Uh, and uh, so somebody, uh, the claims of uh, cell phones being hazardous uh, was made and, and somebody made a lawsuit against Vodacom. And we were at that time working in exactly this field. 
Um, so we got a contract with Vodacom for doing work for them uh, in this field, and later that extended into a contract where we did uh, um, look, uh, we, we look after the safety around Vodacom space stations. So if you see what we did there, so we started off with some research, got one contract, and um, now we've got, uh, we do actually this work for quite a lot of companies, MTA and Vodacom, and a, a number of international companies that also operate into, into Africa. So for instance, in various African countries, there's European um, owners of towers that own these base station sites, and they want to make sure that it complies with international standards. So that, that research project grew into a very good uh, contract work for various companies um, in this field. Um, this is my colleague, Marnus van Wijk, so he's been uh, running this uh, for the past 10 years. A very good operational person, so this is logistically difficult. You have to go to all these base station sites, and so uh, exactly what Marnus is good at, running logistics excellently. Um, from that um, uh, project, we realized that um, that there's a need for software in this field, so we used software where we calculate around base station sites, where we calculate the, the, the exposure areas and where it's safe. Uh, we used it ourselves first on this project, so, uh, and, and then we realized there's a need internationally for this software. There's some competitors, um, but they're not really that good, uh, and then we decided to develop it as a product. And we've been selling that also internationally. In, in Australia, almost everybody is using it, and then quite a few licenses in Canada and a few places in Europe. So I think that's also an example where we did project work um, and we realized out of that you can build a product and we were our own clients at the beginning and eventually we started selling it to, to other um, clients as well. Um, in the same space we realized that there's a need for a device, electronic device to, to warn workers when they work close to base stations. Um, and the, uh, the problem there for Vodacom and MTN is when their workers get close to these antennas, they have to shut down so they lose revenue. Uh, so we would, we would have an area around this base station where the workers can't enter unless it's shut down. But that's, uh, that area is over-conservative. So quite often what happens is the, the site's not running at full capacity, so that exposure area where the people should stay out becomes much smaller. And this little device helps the people to work close to these antennas and to know when they, whether they get overexposed. In this case, the way that we, we funded this is we convinced Vodacom to buy one for each of their workers. So before doing the development, we convinced the client to sign a contract for, with us that they will buy this from us if we develop it at this price. Um, and that, that meant that we didn't have to put lots of money in and hope that there's somebody that's going to buy it. So Vodacom bought, effectively paid for our um, development cost, and then of course we had to deliver it. So the, you know the contract said we have to deliver it and it should work. Uh, so they're using it on, on all their for all their workers, but that created a product that we could start selling, and we've sold now more than 12,000 worldwide, mostly in the United States. Um, so we're working on a version two now, and there's just this continuous buying of this device. I think people. Uh, in the industry working at base station site, there's also a big turnaround, and we can do it at a cost where it's effectively not a capital um, purchase for these companies, it's an uh, operational purchase, and they just continuously buy that. Um, and then uh, the other big project that we're involved with is the SKA project in the Karoo. So we've been involved in, in the research um, of the receiver, so we're looking at that part, uh, there's a model of it, uh, of the receiver of these uh, um, dishes, and um, we started, in, our involvement started in 2005, remember we are electromagnetic engineers, antenna engineers, and we've got the software to solve these problems, um, so we were very well positioned in South Africa to assist the SKA and South African um, uh, idea of, of being part of SKA. Um, now that project, uh, we've grown the company from two or three people helping SKA to probably 28 people now, and we've just got uh, last year the contract to manufacture the first 64 um, of these receivers for, for SKA. Um, and the people involved there is uh, two of my colleagues that also were in the penthouse in the 1990s, so Isak Thron and, and LJ Detoy. 
Um, in about 2012, we realized that we've, as a company, we grew to about 120 people at that stage, and we realized that we've actually gone, um, got most of what we wanted to do in electromagnetics very well, but we want to expand out of electromagnetics. Um, it's too limited, there's too few clients there, uh, and it took quite a long time to get there. And so it's a very lucrative business, but you can't grow 10 times as, as big in this field. So we decided to use our software skills that we've developed and our electronic skills and to look for projects and products where we can expand that and start to sell that to clients. So using the core base of what we've developed and going into different markets. So this is our first product there. Uh, it's a sale for sales rep, so we've never sold to sales rep uh, or to we've never had sales reps before. We only had people selling to engineers that's got a master's degree or PhD or something. So this is a completely new experience for us, and um, we we developed it, uh, developed a few features. This year we really followed the lean startup approach, uh, developed a few features, tried to sign up a customer immediately, got feedback from that customer. And uh, for, for instance, for our third customer, we had to implement something that would cost 300, 400,000 rand in terms of development uh, cost. We will never get our money back from that customer, but we can then sell it on to, to other customers. So that company, uh, that product is really getting traction in the market now. Um, we've invested quite a lot of money. I won't show the number yet, but uh, so we're still down quite a lot, deep in the dip. Um, but the traction is, is excellent, and uh, so we're signing up new people every month uh, with that product. Um, and this is the guy running it, also somebody that did electromagnetic, Sam Clark. It's a completely chaotic business because now we have to invoice people that pay 500 rand a month, and you have to follow up on them. All our previous clients, like for instance Vodacom or NASA, they would pay big amounts one time. Uh, yeah, it's a very good uh, group of people, clients to have. I think for 15 years we never had a single client not paying us. We always get, got our money. So that wasn't the risk in our company. Now this changed completely. So as people not paying, you have to follow up with that. So something new to learn from that. And then finally, in terms of our business, so we wanted to, with, with that field office and Honeybee product, we, we, decided, we saw that this is quite well, uh, working quite well. We can apply our experience into new products. And, and this is the Alchemy Accelerator that Philip spoke about. So what our idea there is we've got some funds that we're generating from our, from our current business. We've got good business experience in, in, in startups, specifically running startups, um, and we want to try to support new startups, invest in new startups, uh, and be involved in new startups to try and see if we can with new ideas, as we did in our company before, but now moving a bit outside of that, take new ideas, take it through an approach where you really start seeing if there's a market, uh, and then creating new businesses from that. So that's our, our vision of what we want to do in the future. Um, okay, so this just uh, briefly about other things in our company. So we've got, uh, from the beginning, we had a, a very, uh, let's say, a university type uh, um, culture. Um, most of the people that work for us just came straight out of university and we sort of enforced that culture. We went to on lots of team buildings. This guy over here, Johan van Tonner, is one of our absolute top developers, you won't believe it. So this is him in, in, at the Zambezi River in 2002. So we went there for a team building, took everybody in the company to, for, for that. So if you look at our profits there at the beginning, you can see that every year when we start making a profit, we would spend it on something like this. And, um, but it, it does create, um, I think the culture in the company is extremely important. It, 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 I won't say family because we're not really like family. We, we do specific things together, we work well together, and that, it does create this environment where people want to work at our company and they like to work at our company. So here's a few of the other things. We went to San City in 2004 with everybody and their families. This was our 10 years at EMSS. We've got a golf day. Um, every year where everybody takes part. So remember, most of the people working at our company, they're developers or engineers, and very few of them are sports people. So, but they take part in these events, and I think uh, most people enjoy it. Also, at lunchtime, um, since I think 15 years ago, or 12 years ago, they, they play 
uh, if I say they, so the developers, they play, <laughs> they play these games. For probably an hour at some stage, we have to interfere and say this is, you know, this is going on too long now. It's interfering with other people's work because it's not quiet when they play these games, but it's sort of a culture. And if people start working with us, they part of that uh, hour lunchtime ETR. So, oh, and, you know, I'm too old, so I played Space Invaders and things like that. So this is out of my league. Yeah. Also, we're a very informal company. So remember, we, our clients are mostly overseas. We never really had to see our clients. So most of the time, people come to work uh, in shorts and things like that. But once a year, we've got this formal Friday where everybody dresses up. Uh, so it's definitely not a corporate culture. And I think we avoid it even when we grew quite big to become a, a corporate. Uh, we're still really a startup in a sense. And coffee, of course. Uh, and then also our box at Newlands. Uh, I mentioned earlier to them that uh, so our box is, I think, just above Christo Visa and just below Johan Rupert in, at Newlands. But, so this is uh, surprisingly inexpensive to have a box, box at Newlands. And most of the people that come there don't understand the rugby, but they enjoy just having drinks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now um, for the final part, just uh, uh, a few people asked me already two or three years ago, but you know, we had a number of successes. Um, there's a number of failures that we have that I didn't talk about here. And the main reason is you try these things, they don't work out and you forget about them. And what you remember is the things that you really spent time on and that become successful. Um, so w lots of people ask me for advice, how did we do it, you know, did, what, what's the recipe? You know, is it just pure luck? I mentioned earlier we were definitely lucky at certain points. Or was the skill involved? Or obviously a combination of the two. So what I did is a, a year and a half ago, I went to MIT um, in an, because I couldn't answer the people. I really felt that I, I can't give advice to people. It's just it's our specific story, and it worked out in a very specific way for us. But I, I can't see exactly what we did that really made it a success. So I went to MIT and uh, spoke to a number of people there, also attended one of their executive courses in entrepreneurship, very skeptical that they will have the recipe. And um, it was quite eye-opening for me. Um, they've got a, a culture, I think they mentioned uh, something like 950 startup companies out of MIT every year, of, of MIT graduates. So really a culture of startups. Uh, it's not like Harvard. I think Harvard is something like 17. Um, because if you, at Harvard you go into corporate world, if you're at MIT, you're going to start a, a company. So th they really support that. And what's also interesting, they've done quite a lot of research over the past 50 years of what works and what doesn't work. And, and I think most of their lecturers admit that what you can do is you can in in increase your chances of success. And it's absolutely no guarantee, but you can at least increase it. Um, so this is one of the people that, that talked at this, uh, this course at, at MIT. Fred Dessner is a very interesting guy from a VC company in Boston. Yeah, so his words were that, you know, um, anybody that, that say they know what will work really suffers from serious case of survival bias. So there's so many companies that try um, to uh, try new ideas, try new products that fail, and you just don't hear about them. You don't read about them in the news, so, and, and uh, so they just disappear. And all of those must be included in your case studies when you want to see if there's a recipe and, you know, what will work. So what, what, they, what uh, um, Fred said is that what they're looking for, they know they can't really predict this. Um, they know they can't uh, go through an Excel sheet or something like that to know what will work or not. So what they're looking for when they do investments is they're looking for the team. They want to know if this, this specific team can nail this. Um, they, they are looking for technology that's unique, so for their specific investment company, wants, they want to know if there's technology that will really solve this problem, uh, and then also traction. So they, this specific VC company won't invest seed funding, so they're looking for traction. Is there somebody really starting to buy this? And then they will go for it. Okay? And then they still don't know whether it will work. Um, the one thing that, uh, that's not showed here, so they obviously um, they only invest in something if it can really um, uh, shoot the lights out because they know they're going to have a few failures uh, so they want to have something that's really big when it works. Um, 
and other interesting character that I uh, that was speaking to us at MIT um, is Paul English. I don't know if you've heard about him. He sold his company Kayak for uh, 1.8 billion in 2012. Um, very interesting guy to listen to. And I think the main thing that I learned from that is this was his third company. Uh, straight out of university, he, he wrote a computer game. Uh, that they, and they had a small computer game company that he sold, and then he built a, uh, another software company that was uh, sold to, I think, for, uh, to QuickBooks or uh, Induit, and, um, and then he built his third company. Every time it took about 10 years, uh, and um, he was speaking about how it became easier and easier because he really learned lessons from his previous experience, and uh, the obvious mistakes that pe people make you could avoid. Um, so this was a very good example, and they had a, quite a, num a few other people also that not only got one time lucky, but did it over and over again. So my, after being very skeptical at the beginning, I'm now much more convinced that you can really increase your chances by avoiding obvious mistakes. Um, now, what I'm going to do now is just my thoughts on these mistakes and what you can avoid. And I just want to say up front, so there's just my thoughts about it. I could be wrong. If there's more information coming, I'll change my mind. Uh, this is just my opinion. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to start off with this story. So the, the question is if anybody can be an entrepreneur. So quite often people say, yes, anybody can be an entrepreneur. So I don't believe it's true. Um, I think uh, just like other things in life, you have to have specific skills. And here's a true, true story. So this is my son, Francois and his buddy, Andre Pollard, who's now the Springbok uh, fly-off. Um, and Francois and Andre used to play together when they were 10 years old or 8 years old. And then, um, and Francois, I think his average at school in cricket was one for the whole season. And Andre broke the records of the most hundreds ever scored. Okay? And, um, and then, you know, Francois would go and play at Andre's house and uh, he'll come back and say, what did you do? You know, we, we played cricket in the backyard. Andre got 273 and I got one. So from the beginning, we could, saw, we could see that this guy's really got talent. And both of them wanted to be Springboks when they were 10 years old. So the real thing is, yeah, um, Francois doesn't have the talent. He can practice as much as he wants to. He can really be dedicated, everything. He just doesn't have the talent. But Andre does have the talent. So together with this, Andre obviously had to practice and you know, commit as well. Um, and I think with entrepreneurship, you really have to know that I think the benefit with, with a tech company is it's not dependent on one people, so you can have a mixture. And I think you, you have to have this mix of really good tech people and good business people. If, you, if you're not the guy that's the really good entrepreneur, if you haven't gambled in your life yet, uh, in a serious way, uh, and then rethink this. You have to partner with somebody that's got some type of entrepreneurial skill. And if you're a, a good entrepreneur but not really good at the tech, don't try to prove yourself at the tech. You know, get somebody that's really good at the tech. People's got limitations, and the sooner that you realize that in life, the better. So this, I think, is important. My colleague Isak Tron is absolutely technically uh, extremely good. But if he, if he was running the country, company, he would still now, I think after 15 years, consider whether you should sign this deal or not. So there, there's a balance that you have to, to get there. So if you, if you can deal with the following, uh, that you, my business experience, my entrepreneurship experience, is that it's, it's absolutely chaos all the time. That there's so many uncertainties, okay? <laughs> there's there's uh, serious conflicts between people uh, especially if you start growing. So if you're not growing and everybody buys your stuff, then uh, you probably don't have these problems. The moment people start buying your stuff um, and, and the company grows, you have to put all these things together. So continuous conflict, continuous infighting uh, of people, and f obviously all this under financial pressure. And this is really true. It's chaotic. Okay? And um, I think it's much easier than solving Maxwell's equation, uh, much more difficult than solving Maxwell's equations. And it, it reminds me more of, of, of chemistry, where there's so many exceptions, you know, there's a few rules, but so many exceptions, it's just, you just can't. You know, so you have to be able to take this. And if, you, if you're not the guy that can take this, and you would rather focus on your development, get somebody that can, can deal with this. 
Okay, so this is a, a interesting uh, um, something that uh, um, Andreessen said. I think it's in the book of uh, Ben Horowitz. Or so yeah, so don't don't worry. It's always dark just before it completely black. So there's many occasions at your company where you you hope it really goes goes bad, and you hope it's just going to go, start going better, and then it just goes worse. So there's things that fail, and you have to accept that. Um, so this is a, another uh, one of the things. So if you if you love what you do and you work really hard, success and money will follow. So I don't believe that at all, but I could be wrong. Uh, I think it's uh, it's um, much more complicated than that. And uh, so if you if you this I think is more uh, what you should look at. So you you, you probably have got. Uh, so remember here yeah, what I mentioned earlier about MIT. You want to increase your chances of success. So I think if you do something. Uh, if you work on something that you're really good at, that increases your chance of success. And if it's something that you really love, it also increases your chance of success. But it's not a guarantee. You need to get somebody that wants to pay for what you do. And people make this mistake. So it's this combination of what you, what you like to do, what you're good at, and what people need um, that you need to solve. Um, oh, yeah, you need the A team, that's for sure. So you need somebody that's really exceptional uh, at some things. Again, like my colleague Isak, um, so absolutely exceptional at certain things. But he's not good at everything. And it doesn't matter so because we can use him in, in that way. So you have to be realistic about this. Some excellent people that you need, you can't do this with a B team. You're going to lose. Uh, and you also need to use these people in the correct position. Uh, most of us as engineers, we think we know everything, so we just can't take it that people think that we're not good at you know, handling people or things like that. So best is know very early on um, who's good at what and apply them there. Uh, uh, this is one of the very important things, I think, as well, uh, which I realized afterwards. You know, we didn't think of these things beforehand. So an engineer typically get an idea they think they're going to develop this idea, and it's going to be absolutely fantastic. They're going to keep quiet about it. Nobody should know about it because they're going to steal it if they know about it. Uh, and then they, if you leave them, they'll develop it in the completely wrong direction. This is not necessarily what the customer wants. So this idea of being open with what you've got, there's exceptions to it. In certain cases, you need to patent something to protect it. But in most cases, I think it's much more important to get your product out there, speak to people, speak to customers, so you can know what they really want and that, what, what they need. Um, one of the advantages we've got, remember I said at the beginning that we worked, um, we did service work, so we had, did computer simulations for clients, so we were effectively our own customer. We, we could see what we want, what we need when we do these projects. And then we could develop, develop for instance, FECO, that simulation package, around our needs, and we were a real customer. So it's very good if you're also one of the examples of these customers, so that you don't miss that uh, and, go, um, and develop the wrong thing. Very expensive to develop something that people just don't need and, and won't pay for. Um, now, this is my second last slide. Um, on the positive side about uh, entrepreneurship is that uh, it is, uh, I think it is quite uh, interesting. It's, you work with very interesting tech. This is now entrepreneurship in the tech world. You can really work with interesting technology. And also, if you make a success out of it, if you start to get money, you can work with more interesting technology because you get the latest computers. You can buy whatever is required to expand this. Um, and although it's very challenging to do this, um, it's also very, very rewarding on many levels. Um, you know, not the same type of reward when you get when you write a really cool program. It's more complex than that and more rewarding in a sense if you like this type of thing. And then, of course, if you, also financial freedom. So if it works out well, um, the financial freedom buys you, let's say, the luxury that you can work on what you want to and what's interesting. And I would say that, um, I mean, all of you that sit here would probably fall under the category of entrepreneurs in any case. Of and, and I would say the upside is, is so big if you really nail it compared to the downside. So if you, if you try it and within a year or two it fails, the downside is very low. You can go and do something else. But if you nail it, um, the upside is big. And that's what you're looking for. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, and although we're quite old now, I'm, I'm almost 50, 
Um, we're very excited to do quite a number of things in the future. Thanks. Okay. Right, questions, of course. You mentioned that you try a more lean approach of the development of the, um, the field office app, but you still had a large downside there. Um, what would you have done differently in the development of the app and that business? Yeah, yeah, so the, the, the problem inside a company that's our size is we're not really a startup. So, for instance, that group of developers, they are used to earning a good salary and bonuses in December and things like that. Uh, so, we, we, we did the, the lean startup part in terms of not developing too many things um, you know, before we get a customer, but the lean startup part that we didn't do is you know, get two or three guys that's, that's willing to work for almost nothing. You know, and, uh, so that's the problem with us. And, and we'll have that same problem again internally in EMS. So if we use EMS people to do it, it would always be quite expensive. It's got the benefit, of course, that um, the developers know what they do, they've done it before, they know how to avoid things. So you, you, you tick off that risk, but you do spend more money. You know. Sorry, on that lean startup, do you think you can apply that to really complex problems to solve? Um, it, is it works well for a simple problem where you've got some easy use case, like but you're really solving something really complex. I think it's not, it's no, not a lot of No, it is, it is difficult. Um, so, for instance, our receiver, our antenna receiver for SKA, it's not something that you can do in the lean sort of way. Um, but on the other hand, um, you must, quite often, you actually can do something quite simple. Although, in your mind, it will only make sense to do it quite complex. So, so at least you should be open to consider whether you can take this feature or that feature away. In hardware, it's obviously more difficult, but it's still possible. Um, our, our hardware device, that uh, uh, device that I showed you that is selling in America now. So there what we did, uh, this is the personal monitor. So there what we did is we decided to, we wanted to know if there's people that would pay for it um, our, our, the way that we compete is in price. So we first implemented very few features and that's why we bring version 2 out now. And our argument was that those few hardware features that's in there, you know, if people buy that, if at least 10% of the market buy that, then we can know we can develop version 2. Um, but in that case, it's not like software, we at least had to go through, you know, getting the molds in place and things like that, so more expensive. South Africa, obviously getting into the international market is always going to be one of the challenges for businesses here, particularly if there's not much of a market in South Africa. You know, you explained a bit in terms of how you set up those channel partners internationally. Can you maybe go into a bit more detail there in terms of, you know, how you chose them and how you shared revenue with them and, mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so for, for FECO specifically, that was the, you know, the simulation software, the market in South Africa is too small. So we knew from the beginning we have to sell internationally. So the, the first thing we did is we went to the trade shows ourselves. So we tried to sell ourselves. And that put us in, in connection with quite a number of people. You know, the, you, you start to know the international people. You know, we went to, to the East, we went to America, we went to Europe. Um, I think it would have been very difficult just from South Africa to try to set up something. So you have to go get out there. You have to start flying to trade shows and things like that. Um, in our specific case, what we did is um, we tried a few people and they didn't fail. So we, we didn't sign long-term contracts with people. Uh, if they looked like a reasonable partner, um, we would sign a short-term contract with um, uh, the, the option to extend it if they reach certain targets. But it was quite difficult to get them. But in, in the case of FECO, there's academic, it's an it's a academic type package. So at the academic conferences, you do meet, meet those people. Um, for field office now, our product, which is the sales rep, it's, we're considering that situation at the moment. So what we'll probably do, need to do there is to go um, to Australia or those places we want to resell and start sp at least do an investigation into, in the industry of potential partners and then fly over and, and sign them up. Yeah, so I would say, I would, to, to summarize, I would say you have to go over there. Don't yeah. do it from here. You have to speak to different people. You must know you're going to make some mistakes. So just don't sign yourself up for too long. 
you know, experiment with it. What is short term when you say short term contracts? What is Look, the guys that, uh, uh, with, with FECO, what happened, you can't expect somebody to invest some of his time if it's, yeah. let's say, a month-to-month -month basis. So what we did is we set up a few years with, um, with targets that they must reach. Um, when we're more com comfortable with people, we set up targets and a few years. And if they meet those targets, yeah. it's fine. So that target, uh, and it, I think the targets would be set quite low at the beginning, but then escalate quite high up to give them some chance. And do they get exclusivity initially, or mm. we um, we if we were confident that people's got a chance, they've got to set up that good work, we would give them exclusivity um, so to make sure that they commit to it. Um, Look, um, so we never, we've never been funded. We tried a few times, and nobody wanted to fund us. So, so um, I think VCs in South Africa, um, they are a bit risk averse, um, and uh, like, like at one VC in Boston said, you can't really predict it. Um, if I were, I think companies should try to not to focus on getting funding, but try to get traction. You know, if you get traction, it's easier. Uh, so companies should try to make some type of plan with your own money or getting a contract or whatever to, to, to get to a point where you get traction. And uh, from the VC side, I, I would say there's a need for people that's willing to take more risks. So for instance, I think with our Alchemy A idea, we're not really VC, we're not VCs, you know, we're more of, uh, uh, let's say, co-investors. For, for us, uh, let's say putting in some money, if it fails, it's not that big a deal, we've got a stream of money coming in. Um, so probably more models than that, that people that's willing to take a chance, not just big chances, you know, every, out of every hundred or so, we probably need that. You know. In getting uh, people, uh, it's uh, too, too far in the beginning. Yeah. So we've looked at it. No, 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 no. What I mean is, we we've just started oh, yeah, it. Yeah. We've just started it. Yeah, we've yeah. we made uh, we've made uh, two investments now, and um, so uh, it's, it's too early to say what uh, you know if there's too few ideas. I think there's got a lot of good ideas and things that will definitely support. You know. This so Alchemy A is not a set program that you have where you start one year in January and yeah. you end the it seems like you've got people approaching you, so you approach it with a per case basis. You speak to the guys, hear what they have and what they want. And, and so that's, that's how Alchemy A operates. Yeah, what we, we're still setting it up. I mean, we're doing, also doing that in the lean startup way, experimenting with it. But I think what seems to would probably work now is more something that we speak to a company, we buy into their idea, we think it could work. Um, if they need funding, we, you know, we provide funding to build a prototype or MVP or whatever, get to that point. But we do want to be involved. We don't want to be a majority partner. Um, we want them to run it. So we, we, because we, like I mentioned earlier, we restrict it in terms of resources and our resources are expensive. So the ideal thing is somebody that's got a company, a few people that can do something. It must be scalable in a way and you must be able to do some MVP and then we work with them on an individual basis. We, we, it's not as a type of accelerator program where we get everybody in together and talk with more individual. Yes? Uh, can you give us an idea of, of the types of, of companies you invest in or the types of products? Um, so sort of stage, uh, B2B, B2C? No, we, uh, I would say anything in software or electronics um, because there we then we've got some experience also in terms of the, the technology. Um, but we, we specifically want to get out of you know, providing to other businesses which we've done. You know, so, um, but if there's a really good uh, 
opportunity for providing to businesses and is a bit more broader than electromagnetics, then we'll definitely consider it. Uh, so, so more general, it will be software and electronics. So, so still, still focusing around electronics? I think, uh, I think the, we'll first try that because that's where we can yeah. add value in a way as well. Okay. Great, thanks, France. Thanks for listening. <laughs>